and I'm going to take my vitamin pills like a good person. Here's what it'll do for you. It'll See that bar, that red bar, how wide that is? If you religiously drink a quart of milk a day, or if you religiously every day take your multivitamin, that's the good you will do for yourself. It's a drop in the bucket. And you might say, wouldn't it be better to do that? But look at the number that you actually need, and I'll show you what it does for people. Now, there are four excellent, perfect, the kind your doctor wants, randomized placebo control studies using vitamin D and sometimes with calcium, but also without calcium, that show taking vitamin D alone prevents fractures in healthy people. You don't have osteoporosis yet. You're worried about bone fractures. And if you're older than 65, which is the kind of group that these studies are done on, these graphs show that if your blood level for vitamin D is on treatment, about 72 nanomoles per liter or higher, you're going to have less fractures. I'm sorry if the graphs are hard to read. These are comparative risks. Um, comparing the placebo group versus people who got the vitamin D. Lately, there were a couple of studies that were in the headlines in April, two British studies that said vitamin D and calcium are useless. Well, unfortunately, these studies were not very well done. And what happened was they didn't raise the blood level for vitamin D very high. There was very poor compliance. They, people, if people don't have to go to the doctor every day in a clinical study, they usually forget to take pills. But the researchers measured the fractures anyway. But my point here is, if people get their blood level of vitamin D up to at least 72 nanomoles per liter, scientifically it's proven time after time after time, including the Richard Dahl Trevetti study that I showed you earlier, that the rate of fractures is down. At what cost? It's so minimal. A year ago, I was invited to take part in a uh, essentially a, a consensus panel. It was a study, a conference on nutrition and osteoporosis, and the question was, if you want to prevent fractures in people, what should the blood vitamin D level be? And then how much should we be recommending to public in order to achieve that kind of a blood level? And the conclusion was the minimum that older people should have in their blood of the 25 hydroxy D should be 75 nanomoles per liter. And they suggested 800 to 1,000 international units of vitamin D should be taken. Now, I have some problems with that, although I was on that committee. The consensus was these numbers. The problem is, when I showed you earlier the normal ranges for Canada, the problem is most of our older people and also most of our younger people are going to be vitamin D deficient with this criteria because they have to take a decent dose of vitamin D. And furthermore, even the 1,000 unit pills are designed to bring your average blood level up to 75 nanomoles per liter. What's wrong with that? That means half the people are going to have less than the average and half of them are going to be above where they should be. So I think, you know, if you're really concerned by the almost the cheapest vitamin pill you can in the drugstore, it's called vitamin D, the 1,000 unit pills, take at least one, maybe two a day. Um, You can take the pills all at once, once a day. You can take seven pills once a week. You can take 30 pills once a month. And that's what a study that we did. This is a collaborator, Sophia Ishalom, out of Israel, where we found that. If you take it once a month, your blood level just jumps a little bit, but the end product is the same. Vitamin D has a long half-life. In other words, it stays in your body for a long time. What you made last summer has to survive in you till February, no doubt about it. You're not getting any vitamin D in your multivitamins to substitute for summertime. So that work that I just showed you, what we've done is broken the groups up. What you want is to target a blood level of 75, right? Well, if we look at the people who had the lowest blood levels of vitamin D in the study that I showed you earlier out of Israel, and if they took 1,500 international units of vitamin D steadily, their blood level on average went to 75. Still, you're supposed to have it higher. 
The next bunch, if you take the ones between 25 and 50, this is normal for you. No doubt, if I measure your blood level, you're probably going to sit where I circled it. And if you took um, 1,500 international units, you'll be that middle bar there. And if, you, if your blood level is relatively high, then yes, maybe the vitamin D will be okay. It probably will be. It'll get you higher than a 75 nanomoles per liter. Um, there was a study that's kind of a fun one. There's a bread company in the United States called Natural Ovens Bakery. And the owner of that sponsored a study in Romania. And what he wanted to do, he knew about this vitamin D story that you need more like four or 5,000 units of vitamin D per day. And what they did was to see whether you could give people in a senior citizen's home, you know, 5,000 units of vitamin D. And the way they worked it, they baked the vitamin D into buns, dinner rolls. So each person in the senior citizen's home in the study ate a dinner roll each day instead of taking a pill. You just had it with what you ate. And their blood level started off like that low group. Their average vitamin D level was about 24 nanomoles per liter. And then after taking 5,000 international units, it pulled them up over three, six, and then finally the 25, um, the, the, the one year at the right, um, it raised their blood levels surely higher than 70, okay? So you get to where you wanna be, in this case, by taking 5,000 units per day. It was safe, none of the biochemistries showed any problem, but this is really interesting. They measured the bone density at the hip and spine at the beginning and at the end of the year. Okay, so we're above 75 there, but the, the, here's the result on the right. The change in bone density at the hip, it went up by 20%. These people had a problem at the beginning. They were vi quite vitamin D deficient. You may think Western Europe is a really great place, but in Europe, they're very conservative with diet. And unfortunately, they don't give a hoot about vitamin D unless there's a research study going on. And so what you've got is a 20% increase, in uh, increase in hip bone density and in, in the spine bone density increased by less. It was about 6%. This is wonderful. If this was really something that was patented, um, you'd hear about it every day on the nightly news. Um, now, here are a couple of things about vitamin D that I think are interesting. We, our genetics was designed for living near the equator. So what happens there? We've got sunshine all year. With a lot of sunshine, your blood vitamin D level is always steady and it's always high. Where we live in Canada, our blood vitamin D, if we're lucky, is around 50. But there's another problem that's happening on top of that. Something that's unusual, the vitamin D level bounces up and down, bounces up and down all the time. And there's some seasonal phenomena that go on in human biology, some seasonal things, and here are a couple of them. Well, one, of course, I'm repeating the blood vitamin D level. We measured them. Um, in young women in Toronto over a two-year period. And you can see here the February is the lowest point in people's vitamin D status. And the bottom graph basically shows um, the percent of them that had a lower level than 40. Now, the other thing that we did, we asked them, how much vitamin D do you take? And what we've got on the left side of the figure is summertime. We broke them up into, I don't take vitamin D. Oh, I take up to about, you know, what I'm supposed to, two glasses of milk. And then the green that you see here is people who say, I take more than 200 international units. These are young women. I take more than the government officially recommends to me. And the key part, what you should really be interested in is the right side of the graph. The people who don't take any vitamin D are just as well off in the winter time as the women who did take even more than they were officially told to take. I would be absolutely furious, and I am actually, I'm hoping you'll get furious about this stuff too. It doesn't do any good. The official recommended, what they call an adequate intake for vitamin D, does nothing. So, um, Ashton Embry, a couple of years ago, started to get quite interested in, in vitamin D, and he, he reads a lot of the literature, and he saw something out of a, a German research that suggested that the number of lesions, brain lesions on nuclear magnetic resonance imaging scans of the brain, you know, in, in, as you follow multiple sclerosis patients, they tended to rise and fall. 
and over here he shows it. So you go from at the far left of the graph, Jan, uh, January, February, etc. Okay, so you can see as you're moving um, into one, the summertime part of the year, the um, the number of lesions for multiple sclerosis go down and the vitamin D levels go up. On the other hand, as the lesions are changing, there's an opposite pattern, seasonal opposites. The higher the vitamin D, the less the multiple sclerosis lesions. It's just a behavior. As you go into winter, the number of lesions changes again. There was a really nice work. There's a, a large group, uh, George Ebers, Dessa Sadovnik, and a number of others who've characterized Canadians with multiple sclerosis. And what they've done here, they published it just this past uh, December, um, a study of your risk of developing multiple sclerosis depending upon the month you were born. I'm sorry if it's a crazy graph. What it means is that in theory, every month of the year should have the same odds of ending up with multiple sclerosis. Now, for babies born in May, there is a statistically significant 10% higher risk of multiple sclerosis than the average for the year. And at the other end of the year, in November, there is a statistically significant almost 10% less risk of multiple sclerosis. In other words, during the summer when the baby was in its womb, in the mother's womb, it was presumably bathed higher in higher levels of vitamin D and somehow was protected against eventually ending up with multiple sclerosis. Now in Australia, they do a lot of very nice research. And Australia has a range in latitude very similar to the United States. And they've done a, a number of studies. And, and in this case, it's one where they were asking people about when you were a child, how much time did you spend in the sun? So the way this graph works is they, they created a statistic of a, a, a comparative risk of ending up with multiple sclerosis and they took the lowest group for sun exposure. People who said, well, I spend one or two um, hours per day outside. They said, okay, let's call your risk of multiple sclerosis one. And then they do more numbers in the survey and the people who say, oh, when I was a kid, I spent, oh, more than half the day, more than four hours outside. And people who gave that answer Statistically, the way they did this work, were one quarter as at risk of developing multiple sclerosis. There's this, it's, this is all circumstantial evidence that might not stand up in a court of law. But what you've got to see is there are pieces of evidence that are coming one after another. The same group that they did other studies and they looked at municipalities in Australia where they, they compared the latitude of the city against the number of people per 100,000 population. Now, as you go south in Australia toward New Zealand, you get less um, and less sunshine and more and more incidence, six-fold increase in your risks of multiple sclerosis. And another graph that they did, they did another kind of measure of sunshine in an area. The, uh, the horizontal uh, part of the graph at the bottom right shows the incidence of melanoma or a kind of a skin cancer. The more skin cancer there is in a city in Australia, the less the risk of people having multiple sclerosis in that city. Again, pieces of evidence that are building up. Um, I